Sybil? Welcome to episode 23 of the 13 o'clock podcast. 23 already. 23 already. Almost yep. six months. Almost. We should probably do something special like when we get to a year. Okay, we can do that. I don't know what. We'll work something out. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure something out. It'll be it'll be kind of cool, I guess. Yeah. Um. Let's see. What do we got to do first? First thing we want to do, we want to give a shout out to Project Entertainment Network again. Mm-hmm. And um, encourage everyone to go and give to their Patreon. Yeah, you get free stuff. You get free stuff. You get buttons. You get, uh, you know, stickers, yeah. postcards. And beer koozies. Uh, beer koozies. <laughs> and finally got around to getting uh, some of our own shirts. Yeah, because remember all those shirts yeah. that I'm always trying to make you guys buy at the end? Okay, so I designed them and we right. have not seen them on actual shirts yet. No, but I finally got a, a real uh, was it Vril Maiden shirt? The Vril Maiden shirt. It right? hasn't arrived yet. It takes a long time for the elves to make them. How long ago was that we placed that order? It wasn't that long ago. Don't about a week? It. Yeah, it was something no, it was like a week, a week ago. Okay. So we'll let you know how the, how they look on the actual shirt. When yeah, we maybe we'll take some them. pictures of them. Yeah, that would be a good okay. idea. We'll put them up on the, on the website. I have high hopes for them, though. The quality should be real good. They better be. Yeah. They were expensive enough. I like the design. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So anyway, with that out of the way, we are now getting to our topic. Sybil. Yes. Yeah, Sybil. And this is kind of, this was actually recommended by a listener. And it's funny because when it was recommended, we had just been talking about about the Sybil yeah. case like a couple of days before. And I was like, duh, why didn't I think of doing a show on well, that? Well, there's a new movie out by M. Night, Sh- what's his name? Sham- Shamalama Ding Dong? Uh, Shamalama Ding Dong. I don't, what, Shamalan is his name, right? I guess so, yeah. yeah. I always call okay. him Shamalama Ding Dong. It's know, easier to remember. Affectionately. Yeah, it's easier to remember. <laughs> and that one seems to be about multiple personality disorder, but you never know. There might be a twist. Oh, I'm sure there is. There's going to be, said. yeah, the M. Night Shamalama Ding Dong twist. Yeah. Like he does. Trademark. Although, man, I, I really liked, what was that one? Um, Unbreakable. Unbreakable. I loved Unbreakable. I know you did. Yeah, I liked that one. I liked The Sixth Sense, and that yeah. was about it. All right. But we're back to Sybil. And I can remember Sybil back when I was a kid, my babysitter t- talking about Sybil. I was about seven. She was probably about 13, 14, you know. And uh, she'd be talking to her friends, and they were scared of this. This was almost kind of like a, a made-for-TV horror movie back in the day. You know, uh, they didn't really know much about multiple personality disorder, but it was almost like on par with, uh, for the time, it was like on par with uh, The Exorcist and The Omen and, uh, you know. Yeah. Amityville Horror. Rosemary's Baby. Rosemary's Baby. That kind of stuff. Yeah. So it had a lot of cultural impact. And actually, now that you mention it, this never occurred to me before. Yeah. But... All of those um, movies that came out like in the early 70s, like late 60s, early 70s about like demon possession and stuff yeah. like that. This is kind of like the psychiatric equivalent of that. Right, yeah. Demon possession and multiple personality have a lot in common. They do. And that's yeah. actually, not, that <laughs> never occurred to me until yeah. you said that. And I was like, wow, maybe that's yeah. why that was such, for some reason, whatever was going on in the culture at the time, yeah. it, possession was like a big thing. Right. And yeah. like, you're you're not who you think you are. There's yeah. other people inside of you and yeah. stuff like that. there are a lot of parallels. Yeah, which is kind of a frightening thought. So I can see right. there was something culturally going on at and the I time can, where... I can remember all the stuff about the abuse, you know. Hold your water and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I, I can remember the girls, you know, older, uh, you know, the older women that surrounded me. All your hot babysitters? All my hot 13 or 14 year old babysitters when I was like seven. <laughs> He Talking was seven. About, it's not a pedophile. I was seven. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. They were older women. They were older women. And, 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 and my favorite one was Kim, and little Kimmy, and she looked just like Princess Leia. Oh. She looked just like Princess Leia. 
That was his earliest crush. This is his yeah. first love. I got pictures of her. My mom took pictures of all of us at one time. I remember I came across them a few years back. And she oh, did. Really? She looked just like Princess Leia. That's hilarious. But what was funny is that she didn't look like an older woman when I saw her. She looked like a little kid. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, she was a little kid. I was like, she, wow, yeah, of course she was. She was 13. You're like, yeah. ooh, now I feel weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyways, okay. So, yeah, so it's kind of cool that it's like that someone suggested this because Sybil... The book came out in 1973 when I was one. Yeah, this is a convoluted case. We have to like keep this nailed down and structured. So what what we're going to talk about is the the book, the movie, and then the actual case. Is that the best way to keep it organized? Yeah, because you know how we do. We kind of go off on tangents, yeah, and that's it, fun. I like doing that, it'll but get it's like real muddy, real quick. But otherwise, I'll just be all over the place, right. and then I'll get stressed out and have to turn it off. So <laughs> because I get yeah. overwhelmed, I'm like, "What was I talking about? I don't know." All my notes are open and shit. Yeah, but um, the book came out in 1973 when I was one. Now I read it. God, I don't remember how old I was. I was probably a kid because uh-huh. I was like, I was all into that kind of shit when I was a kid. And I would just go to the library and I'd get all the adult books out that I wasn't supposed to be reading. And um, so this like fascinated me for a long time. Now, for those of you who are not as old as we are and, you know, don't remember like the huge cultural impact that this had in the 70s. Um, the book actually sold what, like six million copies. Damn. Like before that one. And that was before the TV movie was made. All right. And I'm sure it sold many more after that. So, you know, th- it made uh, quite a bit of money. And uh, the TV movie came out, uh, was shown in 1976, and it had Sally Field in it. And uh, Joanne Woodward played the doctor. And uh, that was, like, huge. Like, everybody mm-hmm. fucking saw that. Mm-hmm. Everybody saw that, and everybody was talking about it. And actually, I think Sally Field won an Emmy for that, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. But the gist of the story is, and Sybil is based on a real person, obviously, Um but that was not her name. It was a pseudonym. And I'll get into that later. Like that later they found out who the real person was. The book was written by Flora Reader Schreiber. She was a journalist. And she collaborated with the doctor, Dr. Cornelia Wilbur. That was her real name. And with uh, the patient, Sybil. Yeah. Sybil Isabel Dorset was the name they gave her for the book. But that was not her name. Now, initially, here was what happened in the book and also to an extent, in the TV movie. And they remade the TV movie, too, in uh, 2007 with Jessica Lange as a doctor. And it was actually pretty good. I, I found it on uh, YouTube yesterday, <clears throat> illegally. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> so if you want to watch it, it's on there still. So, yeah, know. the original's probably impossible to find, huh? Um, I found clips of it. I couldn't find the whole thing. Right. Um, so it's like, it's like trying to find Salem's Lot. Yeah, we, to we buy that one. Yeah, now. we tried to find it. And I even checked Netflix and it's DVD only. And I was like, oh right. my God. That yeah, we recommend Salem's Lot. For for a made for TV movie, that was an awesome movie. It was it was better than I remembered it. It was a lot better than yeah, I remembered Yeah, I like it. Salem's Lot. Yeah, we were just talking about that yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> just tangent, you know. Yeah, another tangent. That <laughs> That's all right. That's what makes Let's, it fun. Okay. So, okay. So, what happened here? This girl, Sybil, she was a college student at the time. And... She initially sought therapy because she was having um, social anxiety, emotional breakdowns. She had been in college for two years and she was actually doing fine before that. But evidently she started having these all these emotional problems. And most significantly, she complained that she was having episodes of missing time. Okay. She was saying, you know, sometimes I'll wake up and it's five days later and I don't know what I've been doing yeah. for the past five and no days. no UFOs reported, no nope. alien abduction, none of that, right? None of this Betty and Barney Hill nope. shit. No, okay. it's like, no, we got, we Good. got, we got Good. anal probed and all, well. Just check. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah. yeah. No, no UFOs. Although I'm surprised that that wasn't, uh, you know, Rex suggested yes. by anybody. <laughs> Next thing you know, somebody will jump on with a book. Oh yeah. It was actually all just alien abductions. Hey, maybe I should write that. Oh, shit. Now I just blew it. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Okay. So anyway, so she's having episodes of missing time. She's saying, I'm in my apartment and I look in the closet and there's dresses in there that are not my style that I don't remember buying. Right. You know, people are coming up and talking to me like they know me. I don't know who they are and all this other kind of stuff, which was obviously very upsetting for her, which as it would be. Now, initially... Reportedly, like I said, the, there's reports, there's all kind of shit about this on the web if you want to look it up. It's kind of like a he said, she said. Yes, this is a very convoluted case. Yeah, kind of thing. It's like there's all, right. all kind of controversy about the diagnosis and all this other kind of stuff. So I'm just kind of going by 
the general consensus of reports. Now, at first, Dr. Wilbur thought that she might have schizophrenia. Right. Which was not terribly weird because her mother reportedly had schizophrenia. Mm. And, you know, it tends to run in families. So she consulted with another doctor named Dr. Herbert Spiegel. And Spiegel put her under hypnosis and stuff like that. Now, as Dr. Wilbur worked with Sybil, evidently it started to come to light that Sybil had dissociated and had 16 different personalities that weren't terribly aware of each other and that Sybil, the main personality, was not aware of at all. Hmm. So now, when you say main personality, you're talking about like supposedly her normal, her personality. normal personality. Okay, gotcha. you, you know, it's kind of hard to sort out because it's like if you have that many personalities, which one is which the one real is the you one? and which right. one is yeah. But generally, they're saying you know Sybil Isabel Dorset, her pseudonym. Mm-hmm. That was her given name, and that was her main personality. Okay. Now, apparently, this personality went and sought treatment, but she did not remember. All these other personalities. Apparently, they were doing shit without her knowledge. Okay. But she didn't, like I said, she didn't know that that's all she knew was I woke up and it was five days later. I woke up and I was in another city and I didn't know how I got there. Shit like that. Okay. So, now there is some controversy over whether Dr. Wilbur, it says that, it says that she hypnotized her, but I don't know if that's the case. However, she did give her sodium pentothal, right. which, as we mentioned on our show on The Devil's Breath, is generally is used as kind of a truth serum type of thing. And she was, you know, apparently talking to her when she was under the influence of sodium pentothal. Okay. And as that started to happen, she began to manifest all these different personalities. Now... The main personality and the one who knew about all the other ones was named Victoria. And she was French. She said she had been born in Paris, Mm -hmm. that she had loving middle class parents Mm -hmm. and so forth. She spoke with a French accent. She could speak some rudimentary French, evidently. And she was kind of like the boss personality. Like she was very self-assured. She knew all of the other uh, personalities. She knew their names and she knew what they were for. So apparently this was kind of like the regulating personality. Yeah. Now in the book... in the, the ringmaster. The ringmaster, I guess you could say. <laughs> now in the original um, book, and I believe in the original 1976 movie, Vicky was only 12 years old. Now in the remake with Jessica Lange, she was 18. Mm-hmm. So she was kind of like a flirtatious French girl yeah. and she was the one that would tell the uh, doctor about what all the other personalities were up to. So, and she was the one that kind of took care of everything. But as um, their kind of psycho, psychotherapeutic uh, relationship continued, um, Dr. Wilbur began to suspect that there had been some kind of tr- very traumatic abuse in her childhood that had caused her to dissociate into all these other personalities. This is where it gets good. Yeah. Because. Some of the personalities seem to remember things that Sybil herself did not remember. Right. Because evidently Sybil was saying, because the abuse, they think it came at the hands of her mother. According to these personalities. According to the personalities. Right. And apparently the mother had done all kinds of horrible things to Sybil when she was a little girl. This is what I remember. This is what I remember. Well, this was the most, I think this is what most people remember, like from the book and the movie, because it was really kind of sordid and out there. Yeah. Like all the stuff that her mother would do to her. Right. Give us some examples. Well, it was kind of a thing like, well, I remember uh, specifically was the ice water enemas. Yeah. She would, um, the mother would tie Sybil's legs to a broomstick. Yeah. And then, you know, stick a tube Mm -hmm. up her butt and then like shoot ice water up her colon. So I'm like, eh. Uh, she would like tie her underneath the piano yeah, while she, she while she played really loud, yeah. and she would like not let her pee. She yeah. would make she would hold your water. Yeah, that was yeah, like kind it. of the famous. That was a uh, famous quote. The hold your water. <laughs> famous quote. And the mom was just generally a, yeah. a shit. I mean, yeah. you know. To speaking of, she would take a dump in people's bushes. She'd run around. You know, the mom in and the, the neighborhood. Day, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Evidently, the mom would run around in the middle of the night, peeking in people's windows with Sybil with her. And then she'd like 
a pinch of loaf <laughs> off into people's on people's yards and everything. It was bizarre. Yeah, it was really bizarre. And also, there were also like some other. Now, apparently, there had been there oh, was some. Oh, I forgot about the lesbian orgies. Well, that's what I was. Teenage girls. That's what I was just going to say. There was yeah. apparently some sexual uh, yeah. abuse as well. Uh, evidently, the mother. She was uh, she was actually called Hattie in the book and the movie, but her mm-hmm. real name was Martha. Okay. Um, she would uh, rape Sybil with various household implements. Yeah. And also, yeah, lesbian orgies with teenage te- uh, teenage girls around the neighborhood um, yeah. that Sybil was apparently seeing. Yeah. I don't know why. And, you know, things of that nature. I mean, some of the stuff seemed... I was almost going to say reasonable. That's probably not the word I want to use. Yeah, no, no. Believable. Plausible. plausible. Right. Some of the stuff seemed a little off the rails. Now, how old was Sybil supposedly when this was going on? Well, see, now this was different ages because they kind of figured out that like all her personalities kind of corresponded with ages at which particularly horrible things happened to her. Okay. Like one of the... One of the personalities, I believe his name was Ruthie, Mm -hmm. was a baby. Okay. And she was like pre-verbal. Okay. So whenever she went into that personality, you know, obviously the doctor couldn't really communicate with her because she would just like make make baby noises. And, um, but some of them were, you know, three years old. I think one was six. But when all this running around the neighborhood and the lesbian orgies, how, how old was... Sybil supposed to be at that time. Does anybody know? No. It's too vague. Yeah. Okay. So she couldn't give times and dates or anything when this was right. happening in the book. Okay. Right. Now, in the book and the original movie and in the remake, um, the doctor works with Sybil for about 11 years. They okay. develop a very close friendship. And as it goes on, she is able to hypnotize Sybil and convince all of the personalities to um, progress in age to the same age as Sybil is, because most of them are younger. And once she does that, you know, it takes several years, but eventually she's able to integrate all these different, all of the different personalities into, you know, one personality. Now, Now in the book, more or less, how old is she when she's able to do this? Integrate them all. She, I think, yeah, I think she was in her thirties at that point. Okay. Maybe forties, actually, because I think I I think she was like in her thirties when she first started. If I remember correctly, she was born in like nineteen twenty nine. Nineteen twenty three. Two twenty three. Nineteen twenty three. So she was, you know, up there in age. Yeah, yeah. She wasn't like a kid. Right. Yeah. But um, the thing is, here's where it gets kind of murky, because many years later, when they finally found out who the real person was that Sybil was based on. Um, there's kind of a lot of, there's a lot of controversy about how much of her story was true. If it was completely fraudulent, if it was simply exaggerated, if her symptoms were encouraged by the therapist, how much of the abuse was real. Um, because it kind of ties in. And I think we talked about this a little bit on episode two about the satanic panic, because we talked about the whole repressed memory thing that got very, very big in the 80s. Yeah. Where a lot of therapists were, like, suggesting. Right. Like, satanic ritual abuse and other kinds of, like, really yeah. horrific yeah. kinds of abuse to their patients. And they don't know if a lot of it really happened or not. Or if it was just suggestible people being given right. these false memories. Well, in the satanic panic show that we did, you know, we demonstrated that a lot of what was reported could not have happened. Yeah, you it cannot, was impossible. You cannot flush a little kid down a toilet and then have that little kid arrive alive in an underground torture chamber. Yeah. And and, and Chuck Norris was not beating that little kid. <laughs> right. There, okay. That we know and, of. <laughs> and, and, and Satanists were not flying away in balloons. Right. You know, that was not happening. Yeah. So obviously, and like I said, this is where it gets a little tricky because... Yes, child abuse is a horrible problem. Yes, a lot of children are abused. Some of them quite horrifically and grotesquely. Mm. But, you know, because of the satanic panic and what happened in that, in like the McMartin preschool case and stuff like that, where these kids were coming up with this shit that was just crazy, that was just impossible. Right. So now it's kind of swung in the way other direction where it's like the crazier your abuse is, the more people are being like, fuck, nothing Mm. happened to you. Right, yeah. 
And I'm not sure that's the case here. Now, what I should say is that, you know, after Sybil was identified as Shirley Ardell Mason, that's her real name. Mm -hmm. She's dead now, but um, she was identified before she died as, uh, as being Sybil. Now, her mother reportedly was schizophrenic. Okay. Neighbors have reported that she was weird. Right. That she did creep around at night looking at people's windows. Not so much about the pooping. Okay. But, um, you know, when the, the woman that lived across the street... <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, it's awful. It's awful. Yeah, yeah. The woman who lived across the street did say she would creep around at night and look in people's windows, which right. is kind of weird enough. And that she was kind of witch-like. Right. Um, not a real happy woman. Right. And um, other neighbors and a couple of Sybil's teachers, you know, have said that, um, you know, the the parents were very strict. They were Seventh-day Adventists. Right. And, um, you know, they, they would hold her hand really tight or they wouldn't let her do anything and right. stuff like that. Were they strict? Sure. Right. Were they abusive? Eh. Right. Hard to say. Right. Might have been. Now, Sybil's father, mm -hmm. you know, said no. He obviously, he defended his wife. Right. Um, but, you know, he would do that. So there's no way of knowing whether the worst of the abuses happened. Okay. However... Yeah, there are no witnesses. Yeah, there were no direct witnesses. And they couldn't find any uh, teenage girls that they that, that had been involved in these orgies or anything like that. Right. right. So, you know, the thing is, Sybil was obviously an emotionally disturbed woman. She had problems. Right. Did the problems come from this, like, unbelievably Baroque um, abuse? Can't really say. Right. Could have happened. I mean, none of the stuff she said was impossible. It was just probably pretty unlikely. Right. But she might have been abused, you know, just right. in a kind of run-of-the-mill, quote-unquote, kind of way. You know, right. that didn't involve lesbian orgies in the woods. And holding your water and all that. Yeah. Well, that could have happened. That Who could have happened. Yeah. So, anyway, so the real woman, Shirley Ardell Mason... And she was born in 1923 and apparently um, quite brilliant, okay. reportedly IQ of 174, which is, you know, very high, very talented artist, mm -hmm. very talented musician. Okay. Um, although later on, some of her personalities could play piano and some of them couldn't. Okay. And another thing that kind of came out later, and I think they went into this in the book and also in the movie a little bit. That most of her personalities could paint, mm -hmm. but when you saw uh, the pictures that she would do under the influence, they were kind of different styles. Okay. You know what I mean? Which was kind of a weird thing. But when the book and the movie came out and was such a big cultural phenomenon, it seemed like now previously to the book coming out, there had only been between 75 and 200 cases of multiple personality disorder diagnosed in the world. Right. Now, after that came out in the ensuing decades... Let me guess, they increased. Yes, yeah. exponentially. Okay. And... It became a fad. Yeah. All right. And, you know, tellingly, the diagnoses only uh, really increased in North America. Right. You know, which... Where, where it was released. Where it was released. So whether that was a case of therapists now saying, oh, now we recognize the symptoms of this disease so we can diagnose it more easily, or whether it was kind of a thing where we're just going to take this other, you know, mental disorder and kind of glom it onto this because it's faddish. Right. And I really don't think that that controversy has really been resolved to anyone's satisfaction, even to this day. To me, it sounds a lot like the alien abduction thing, where you put right. somebody under hypnosis and they remember all this all this stuff that happened to them that probably didn't happen. Yeah. Although there are a few of the alien abduction cases that are kind of compelling. They're interesting. But uh, it kind of reminds me of that. Yeah. And like I yeah. said, it kind of reminds me of that whole false memory thing. Of you the know, satanic of panic. Of the satanic panic. Like Michelle right. remembers that right. book and all that other 70s kind of stuff. 70s and 80s. The yeah. 70s and 80s. That was a very big thing. So it's right. kind of hard to tease apart. Right. Now, there have been accusations by different doctors that Cornelia Wilbur, the doctor, the therapist who was treating Sybil, either purposely or sort of accidentally 
suggested these personalities, suggested multiple personality disorder, either in order to, I mean, either in order to sell books Mm -hmm. or because she really thought that that's what was wrong with the woman. Right. You know, I don't want to impugn the woman's reputation. She's dead too. Um, You know, she wasn't a quack by any stretch of the imagination. She won a lot of awards and accolades and stuff in her field. And, um, but there have been some accusations that she and Sybil and uh, Flora Schreiber, who wrote the book, kind of collaborated and, you know, had this kind of plan. There's a business plan. A it. business plan that they were going to make like yeah. a cultural thing. We're going to have t-shirts. We're going to write a musical. Right. We're going to have a board game. Yeah, we, We're going to have that kind of stuff. So there is some evidence that they kind of wanted it to be multiple personality disorder because it was sexy. Yeah, and we can get more into that in the second half of the show. Yeah. Because uh, the more you look into this case, the more you find out that there was there was some, uh, what's a good way to put it? Shenanigans. There was some shenanigans with this case. It's not Allegedly. Always, alleged shenanigans. Alleged shenanigans. I think it's a mixture. I think yeah. the case is actually a mixture. We, we should probably take a break now. Yeah, we're almost at the halfway yeah, point. Yeah, and then we can get more into it, and, and then we can wrap this up, you know. Yeah. Because... Uh, it's an interesting case, but there's a lot of stuff that were, you know, that was kind of in between the lines. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of gray area. There's some gray areas. There. Okay, so we're going to take a break, and we will be back in just a minute. I'm Captain Dallas Lee, and I'm one of the characters in the Kirkman Journals, Project Entertainment Network's Pro Wrestling Podcast. Every Friday, Token Top Clark, Steve Messer, and the Viking Superkick Pro Wrestling in the Hot Spot. Featuring interviews with the up and coming indie superstars that are stable and shoots while it works. You can only hear them on the Project Entertainment Network. <laughs> Thank you very much. Remember the Alamo! Subculture Corsets and Clothing is our favorite store for unusual clothing, shoes, and accessories. They offer a wide selection of men's and women's clothing at great prices. Subculture also offers a cool selection of shoes and accessories. Steampunk, gothic apparel, retro, corsets, and so much more at Subculture Corsets and Clothing. Check out Subculture online at subculturecorsets.com. That's subculturecorsets.com. Make sure you use the discount code 13 o'clock for a 10% discount. Subculturecorsets.com or visit their store in Jacksonville, Florida, just off I-95. The Necrocastic Horn. The podcast that blends horror and heavy metal properties the common connection brought to you by hosts talking tom clock max x smoking ward hades and Azrael mordecai featuring interviews and more with the stars of metal and horror the necrocasticon mondays on project entertainment network Fiction, horror fiction, the Rochdale House of Fires, the Mammoth Mountain Poltergeist, the Associated Hopeful Monsters, Red Menace, the, the Five Tenebrous, Poisons, Bellwether. Go to www.jennyashford.com or search Amazon for the Jenny Ashford author page. Okay, and we're back. Yeah. So when we uh, left, we were just talking about the kind of controversy about the diagnosis and, you know, what what they may have stood to gain from making it multiple personality disorder. Now, I don't think anyone anywhere is saying that Sybil didn't have some type of mental disorder. She clearly did. At least schizophrenia. Yeah. And actually, I mean, reading about her, I sort of feel bad for her because... I don't know if she was really, I'm not saying she wasn't a willing participant if this was kind of, you know, an exaggerated kind of thing to sell books, but the way she was, it almost seemed like she went along because she thought that's what the doctor wanted. Right. 
And that's what some, that's what other doctors have said later, including Dr. Spiegel, who mm. also, he didn't really treat her, but he saw her a bunch of times and apparently he hypnotized her also. Now, Dr. Spiegel said that he did not think that Sybil had multiple personalities in the classic sense. He thought that what was happening was that she was, you know, maybe she had some repressed memories. Maybe she had some abuse in her past and she had had some kind of PTSD type of reaction Mm -hmm. where she was walling things off. But he thought what was happening was that the doctor, while Sybil was on sodium pentothal when or when she was under hypnosis, that the doctor was suggesting to her Mm -hmm. that these different memories or these different aspects of her personality were a separate person and were like giving them names. Thereby creating. Thereby creating a separate personality when maybe there wasn't one there before. That was that was Dr. Spiegel's take on it. Right. He just thought that Sybil was probably an emotionally, you know, kind of emotionally unstable kind of person and she was real suggestible right he said it was very easy to hypnotize her Mm -hmm. um which is common with people with these types of disorders and that maybe she was kind of taking like for example and i think they even uh mentioned this in the book in the movie that she had um a child personality named peggy that was sort of the one that took on all the anger allegedly at, right. at what her mother had done to her uh-huh. because the real Sybil apparently was not allowed to express her anger mm-hmm. or her hatred toward her mother right. because of their religion, because of what have you. Right. So apparently it was all glommed off onto this Peggy personality. Okay. So what Dr. Spiegel would, would suggest was going on there that maybe Sybil, the main personality had all of this repressed anger mm-hmm. Which was still her. Right. But that Dr. Wilbur was calling it Peggy. Right. So in other words, as the therapy continued, more and more personalities would emerge. Right. And I think the the records of, of the therapy demonstrated that, right? That some of these personalities didn't have names at first. Yeah. That's how I remember. Most of them ended up having names. I think there was one, um, one of the ones to emerge later was called The Blonde. She didn't have a name. And I don't know if they put that in the movie, but that was in the book. But, um, and I think that was the personality that ended up becoming the dominant personality at the end when they were all quote unquote integrated. together, right. But, you know, like I said, this is so, this is so like um, hard to tease apart because evidently the, you know, the doctor... I don't think Dr. Spiegel said he didn't think that Dr. Wilbur was doing this to harm Sybil or that he was doing it on purpose, that she was doing it on purpose. Um, He just thought that because Sybil was so suggestible and so eager to please, she wanted to make Dr. Wilbur happy. You know, they were friends. They were together for such a long time. And So he thought that maybe Dr. She was just doing what she thought Dr. Wilbur wanted. Which is create more personalities. Which is create more personalities. Now, the more um, kind of cynical Mm -hmm. uh, critics Mm -hmm. allege Mm -hmm. that uh, Flora Schreiber, the woman who wrote the book, and Dr. Cornelia Wilbur were fully aware that Sybil did not really have multiple personality disorder, but that the publisher of the book that they had already worked out the contract with Mm -hmm. said, no, it's got to be about multiple personality disorder because it's kind of a sexy disorder. It's kind of coming up, you know, it's we'll sell a lot of books. And we'll sell a lot of books if it's that. So there was something to gain financially. Right. By having her have, or at least claim to have, multiple personality disorder. Yeah. Because of the book. Right. Okay. And muddying the waters is the fact that apparently Sybil had written a letter in which she said that she did not have multiple personality disorder and that she was kind of, she said that she knew something was wrong with her, Mm -hmm. but that she was essentially making it up Mm -hmm. because that's what she thought Dr. Wilbur wanted. Right. However, now I should note that. Yeah. I should note that this letter um, was put in the original book. Okay. Flora Schreiber did put it in the book. Okay. So they didn't try to hide it? No, they didn't try to hide it. They said Sybil did say that in a letter. However, how they spun it was that she said, well, she said Sybil, the main personality, 
she had been in a two day fugue mm -hmm. when that letter was written. So one of the other personalities wrote it and Sybil didn't remember. Okay. And this other personality was apparently fighting against the therapy. All right. And I think they showed this in the movie too, because apparently at first the personalities, quote unquote, right. did not want to be integrated. Right. So they were fighting because a lot of them didn't know about each other. So this statement of I don't have per multiple personality disorder was actually could possibly have been given by an alternate personality. Right. right. And just saying that because she wanted to get out of therapy or right. she didn't want to be integrated with the other personalities right. or whatever. That's why this is such an awkward right. kind of case, like such a controversial case, because there's really no way of knowing. Right. If what I mean, because this was. woman was was a right. kind of, you know, emotionally unstable and stuff like that. So can you take anything she said? If she said, yeah, I don't have multiple personalities. Yeah, you couldn't really. You, you can't really like. Yeah, you take that with a grain of salt. Yeah, because yeah. it's like, you know, she could just one of the other personalities could be saying that. Yeah. Or she could just be saying that to get out of, you know, whatever, like the next breakthrough was going to be because it was hard right. or whatever. <laughs> you know, she could just be in denial. Right. So like I'm saying, they, you know, to their credit, they didn't um, they didn't hide that letter. Now, evidently, like I said, the two of them, uh, Dr. Wilbur and Sybil, or Shirley Mason, I should, was her real name, but I'm just going to keep calling her Sybil because it's less confusing. But they had a very, very close relationship. Now, allegedly, at some points, when um, Sybil was, you know, younger and she was first starting to undergo the therapy, she didn't have a job. And so... Dr. Wilbur paid her rent and mm -hmm. bought her clothes and right. things like that. So, like I said, there might have been some financial, um, you know, some right. financial gain going on there because she didn't um, she didn't have another way to support herself. And I should note also that they stayed friends. Like apparently, well, now um, Sybil ended up having to move out of her hometown because after the book came out, even though details had been changed, even though her name had been changed, even the names of all her alternate personalities had been changed. Um, people figured out people who it was. figured out who it was because it right. was a small town. She was from a small town in Minnesota, Minnesota called Dodge Center. And, um, you know, they knew exactly who that book was about. Right. And uh, so it was a little awkward. So she had to move away. Now, it seemed like for the rest of her life, she lived real close to Dr. Wilbur. So she'd like, you know, move closer and stuff like that. Now, she did get a job later. She was um, an art teacher. She taught art. She taught art at a, at a community college. And apparently she was a very good teacher, very good artist also. Yeah, she had a high IQ. Yeah, very talented woman. Um, but it kind of like there came a point when she got older where she couldn't um, make any decisions without her doctor's input and things like that. So there might have been some kind of weird like symbiosis going on with the two of them. Right. Not real sure. And like I said, you know, the book and the movie um, proceeds were all divided three ways between the doctor, Sybil, and the author. And... The, the kind of the weird thing, too, is that later on in life, Sybil, um, actually, she got breast cancer yeah. in uh, 1990, about 1990. And she did not like doctors, yeah. did not like hospitals. So she denied, uh, she said she didn't want treatment. Wow. So now the cancer went into remission right. for a while. But then a couple of years after that, Dr. Wilbur got Parkinson's disease. Mm-hmm. And Sybil moved into her house mm -hmm. to take care of her. Wow. Okay. So, um, you know, so Dr. Wilbur ended up dying of Parkinson's disease. And then, um, you know, Shirley Mason, a.k.a. Sybil, she died of breast cancer much later because she denied treatment. Right. And it was kind of... Now, friends of hers, when she died, she died in 1998. And, you know, they said that she was quite happy when she'd never married. She never had children. She always kind of lived alone, kind of reclusive. Mm-hmm. You know, she had cats, played in her garden or whatever. And oddly, even though, um, you know, her evidently her family's faith had been kind of a big bone of contention that they were real strict and stuff like that. She stayed a Seventh Day Adventist until she died. So, like I said, maybe not. Now, she had severed all ties with her hometown. She didn't talk to her family anymore. She didn't talk to her old friends anymore. So, you know, there might have been some shit behind that, too. One of the weird things that struck me about this case is that there was merchandising involved, though. Yeah. What was that? They were trying to sell t-shirts? Yeah, they actually, there is some evidence that the three women had started, and this was even before the book came out, Okay. that they had, um, they had registered Sybil Incorporated. A Sybil Incorporated. Yeah. And that, w that was going to be like books, movies. They were going to do like a board game. They were going to do like t-shirts. A board game. 
Yeah, which how I was like, how do you multiple, make a multiple personality, personality board, board game? game? That's some wild shit there. Yeah. Th- th- there's something suspicious about that. That's what I mean. If you ask me, there's something suspicious about that. Yeah. That's weird. Now, like I said, it should be noted, like, how how much of this was the doctor just being a cynical cash grabber and saying, yeah. oh, here's somebody I can mold into somebody with multiple personalities. Right. Cause like I said, you know, after all this stuff about repressed memory syndrome and false memory syndrome, it's very easy. It turns out to implant false memories into people's heads, right. especially if you put them like under hypnosis or you put them under the influence of some right. drug or something like that. And you keep telling them that this happened right. to them over and over. Eventually, They'll remember yeah. it like it really happened. They'll even start adding details of their own. Weird. And that's very, very easy to do. Yeah. I mean, before, I think I think many years ago, people used to think, oh, your memory was like, you know, like a videotape. You could just play it back. Right. Memory is not like that at all. Well, okay. So what, what do you think was really wrong with her? Now, here's the thing. Many other... Th- there was a book that came out by Debbie Nathan, yeah. and this came out... Um, in the late nineties, I believe it was called Sybil exposed. And her theory was she went through a lot of Dr. Spiegel's papers and, um, you know, various other things. And she kind of came to the conclusion that, that one, Dr. Wilbur was kind of exploiting Sybil, like kind of molding her into somebody. She thought that Sybil might've had pernicious anemia of all things. What? Yeah. What's that? Because apparently it's some kind of blood disorder and I guess back in the day, it used to manifest like the symptoms that it that it would uh, present with were sometimes misidentified as like uh, very psychiatric disorders. Now, according to the book Sybil Exposed, um, when they treated Sybil with like, uh, you know, liver supplements and things like that, like she actually would get better, like her psychiatric symptoms would go away. Allegedly, I don't, you know, I don't know. Right. That's I've really only read that in a couple of places. Like in that one book. So, you know, whether it was anemia or whether it was something else, I tend to think, like as I'm not a psychiatrist, Mm -hmm. I tend to think that it was some type of, could have been schizophrenia, could have just been, you know, borderline personality disorder, Mm -hmm. could have been something like that. Because, I mean, initially the symptoms that she presented with, and I should note too that multiple personality disorder, it's not, they don't call it that anymore. Yeah. Um, since I believe the DSM four, which I think came out in 2000, um, actually might've been earlier than that. They might've changed it in 1980, but, uh, they actually call it dissociative identity disorder now. And it's still a very controversial because some psychiatrists mm-hmm. don't even think it exists. Right. They think that it's, you know, that it's being confused for other things. Hmm. Because it's very rare to see the type of thing that was presented, at least in the film, where this woman is just like switching personalities like on a dime. You know what I mean? Right. Like she's in the office and she's like, oh, now I'm this person. Now I'm a baby. Now I'm this. Now I'm yeah. They said it's very, very, very rare. Right. And most of the symptoms, like I said, the most significant sim- symptom is missing time. When you come in, you claim, hey, it's five, it's five days. I don't remember what I did. The right. last five days. And, um, you know, but that is also a symptom of one of schizophrenia, mm-hmm. also borderline personality disorder. So I think nowadays, though there is no consensus, I think nowadays dissociative identity disorder is kind of seen as a subset of borderline personality disorder. Okay. Cause some of the manifestations are the same. So I don't think people are, um, you know, I don't, I don't think it's like a separate diagnosis necessarily. It's like a spectrum disorder and it yeah. can go into this realm. Because it does seem like most of the people that are diagnosed with it, mm-hmm. it's kind of just a handful of psychiatrists that are diagnosing these people. Okay. You know what I mean? It's not, and there's not even really any agreed upon symptoms that are like, yeah, that's what that is. Because it's kind of a very awkward kind of thing to diagnose you know, because it manifests in such a strange way. Hmm. And also, I think in the in the newest uh, DSM, they also have something called uh, possession trance or something like that. Wow. So they're kind of tying it together, like you were saying about the movies earlier. Right, yeah. They're kind of tying it together with people that think they're possessed by demons or think right. they're being taken over by other right. creatures or other identities. Hmm. And it should be noted, too, that 
I, I just re- I read this on the Wikipedia page about dissociative identity disorder. It's really long, but it's kind of interesting that some people that have presented with this alleged disorder, mm-hmm. you know, not only do they come out with like normal people, they said most of the time, most of their identities are just other regular people. Right. But sometimes mm-hmm. you get ones that are animals, animals right. or um, celebrities or <laughs> so- mythological creatures or mythological people. <laughs> you, like, said so- you said celebrities. It reminded me of that program, that, that program we saw last night with a guy who thought he was Madonna. Why oh yeah, Madonna. My Strange Addiction. <laughs> yeah, we were watching My Strange Addiction last night, and that guy wanted to be Madonna. Yeah, and not just dress up as Madonna. He wanted, he wanted to, to actually be Madonna. Be Madonna. Yeah. It was kind of sad. He was all right at the end. I think he threw all his Madonna yeah. stuff away. But um, so like I said, kind of. I don't like wish to because, like I said, most of the people involved are dead. The you know, Sybil is yeah, dead. Yeah, most people Dr. are dead. Robert you'll never dead. really know, and you'll never really know whether this was a real disorder. Or whether it was something that was just kind of, you know, finagled into that to yeah. make a particular narrative. Yeah. Because you have to think that, like I said, just like we talked about on the Satanic Panic show, and we talked about it a little bit on the Amityville Horror show too, it seemed like the cultural, you know, whole milieu of the time was for some reason everybody was super into demon possession and like yeah. being taken over by other identities that was a very big yeah it was weird fad then and it kind of went way you know went with that yes and it went into the 80s so i can see how this kind of identity switching type of thing would appeal right to people from that time period i definitely think she was mentally ill I yeah yeah that. i don't think anyone is disputing right. that i think her doctors were trying to help her Right. Yeah, I don't I right. don't think like I know that some uh journalists and some right. other doctors have said that maybe right. that there was some malicious, but I don't think that. I don't think she but was. But I do also think that the that the do- it was a priority for the doctors to have this be a multiple personality case for money and that money would also help Sybil. Yeah. And I think the multiple personality disorder thing that she had uh, from what from what I can tell was intermittent. Sometimes yeah. it was. Sometimes it would get better. Sometimes it would go away. Yeah. But uh, I kind of I agree with you. I I think it was probably more like schizophrenia. Yeah, or, it might have been. Or, or uh, what do they call it? Borderline or personality disorder. Borderline personality disorder. Or, yeah. Yeah, I generally do think that I don't think Doctor Wilbur was necessarily trying to exploit her. I think she was trying to help her. But it might have been a case where. Here's a woman that's presenting with these kind of strange, unusual symptoms. Right. And, you know, multiple personality disorder at the time was very, very rarely diagnosed. Right. So you can see how a doctor at the time might be encouraged, maybe not even consciously. Right. To sort of push her in that direction. Right. So she could have like a kind of unusual case study. Right. Right. To sort of base her career upon. Right. And, you know, like I said, the woman had a good career before that, but she's still, to this day, best known for this case. For this case. Right. And I should note that also later on, Mm -hmm. um, she was actually uh, instrumental in getting, I I believe his name was Billy Milligan, but he was one of the first people to uh, the first male to get off on uh, an insanity defense for multiple personality disorder. She was mm. like instrumental in his defense. Wow. So that right. was like the first time of that happening. So she was kind of like the go-to person for this, for right. multiple personality disorder. And she got known for that, which, yeah. you know, you can see how the, you know, the, um, especially if you're a doctor, you don't want to just, you don't want just boring old, old doctor. You want to be a celebrity doctor. Yeah. You kind of yeah. want to be a celebrity and you're like, here's a woman that has these weird symptoms and I right. can kind of, Push it in that direction. This is a this is something that hardly ever happens. Yeah, and it's very rare. Right. You know, it's just like not like normal bipolar disorder, depression, right, right. yawn. You know what I mean? Right. This is sexy. She has. She doesn't remember. She she's some of her personalities. One of them was a baby. Two of them were boys. Yeah, and stuff like that. And it was just this kind of weird, sorted. Yeah. And I mean, I, oh, I should note this was kind of funny. I think they went into this in the movie too. But she had two male personalities. One of them was a uh, Sid, and I can't remember the other one's name, but um. They were teenage boys. And evidently, when she was one of these boys, she really thought, or she said, that when she grew up, she was going to grow a penis, and she would be able to put a baby in a girl. (laughs) 
That's what one of the male personalities said. Finally be able to pee standing up. Yeah, I guess so. But apparently, and when I saw that, when I saw the movie, like the, the boy Sid would get really annoyed when the doctor would be like, but you're not a boy. You don't have a penis. You're not, you know, That's you're a girl. Funny. And he'd get really upset about that. That's funny. But apparently, um, you know, the boy was, he was a carpenter, just like her real father had okay. been. So they were all obviously fragmented you know, fragmented aspects of her own personality. Right. She was just kind of personifying them right. or the doctor was doing it and giving <laughs> them names. But, um, you know, like I said, it, it's kind of, it's kind of a sad case. And I feel like, I feel like Sybil herself, I don't know if she's necessarily a hundred percent the victim, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, she obviously had a lot of problems and, I mean, the doctor did help her. Right. She did end up having like a relatively normal life later on. Mm-hmm. I mean, she painted. She was a teacher. She was doing stuff like that. So, you know, did it really hurt her? I doubt it. Yeah. They did make some money off of it. They did make some money off of it. Right. Actually, uh, when yeah. Dr. Wilbur died, she yeah. left her twenty five grand, okay. which, you know, um, which was nice. And so, so not a hoax. Not no. a hoax. It did happen. Might have been slightly a misdiagnosis. There may have may have been played up a little bit. Yeah. But still an interesting case. And the abuse, we don't really know yeah, how much knows. of that happened. Yeah. That might have been exaggerated. Kind of like flushing kids down the toilet. Yeah. Go back yeah. and listen to the Satanic Panic show. Yeah, that's actually what that's still one of my favorite shows. That yeah, it's we did. funny. I just funny. I just because we lived through that and I just remember so much about it. Yeah, it we have so some funny. comments on that one, you know, some guy was saying, uh, yeah, man, I lived through it too, man. Like, like yeah. I know what you guys are talking about. Yeah, people our age, we remember. Yeah. So like I said, this is kind of like a it's probably like why I'm so fascinated, why I've always been so fascinated with this case, because it's almost like the same thing. Yeah. Because I've always been fascinated. From the same with, era. I've always been fascinated with false memory syndrome. Yeah. And that whole thing about people being able to, because that freaks me out. It freaks me out that people could put you under hypnosis or give you give you a drug or something like that, and then suggest all this shit, and then you remember it like it really happened. That is fucking freaky. Yeah. Because I used to, I mean, you know, and probably most people when they grew up, you think that your memory is like pretty good like oh i remember this happening. you just play that's it back pro- in your it's head proven that your memory is really bad it is very bad yeah and it's reconstructive every yeah. time you think back to an event you're adding yeah. and changing it all right so it's never the same i can remember how how cool thing I, I i remember how cool certain toys used to look when i was a kid from back in the 70s yeah and then if you look that up on google to see what that toy actually looked like you it's nothing like you remember it no you're like man that thing's fucking lame <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah well everything's cool when you're a kid it's yeah when of, you're a kid everything's cool it's that's the only it. thing that sucks about well not the yeah. only thing but that's one thing yeah. that sucks about getting older it's like nothing's cool anymore go back and look at some old music videos a lot of them don't look anything like you remember them well yeah and yeah. The, and that's kind of the thing because that was my big thing when i was a kid was because yeah. you know mtv started when i was nine and i was like yeah. glued to it from then on right and I still have such fond memories of all these yeah. videos, and now you can see them you look at them, you go, on YouTube, and you're like, cheap looking. wow, yeah, yeah, that looked like it was made for like a buck 98. Yeah, look at his hair. <laughs> look at their hair. Wait, why did we think that was cool at the yeah. time? Why? Why, did, why did I think that that outfit looks so cool? You look at it now, and you know, flock of seagulls and shit. <laughs> I still kind of liked his hair. I yeah. liked his hair. But, uh... <laughs> We can wrap it up. Yeah, okay. So we're getting close yeah. to the end of the show. Hope you guys enjoyed it. It wasn't too rambling, I hope. Yeah, we're going to ramble. That's well, you is. know, that's how we do. These are for entertainment purposes. And, just you know, there's a lot about this case. If you're interested in it, you can go look at it. Yeah, re- and, and read the and book. The book is excellent. Even if the abuse part was bullshit, it's still, like, pretty yeah. salacious. And I, I it's it's like actually kind of hard to do a show on this because there was so much about it. Yeah. And a lot of it is hearsay. Yeah. And like I said, it's, and it's something like they're all dead, so you're never going to really sort you're out. You're never going to know. Right. And, and you know, the, the character, one of the characteristics of mental illness is that it's subjective, you know, right. so you're never going to know what yeah, yeah, her yeah. problem really was or yeah. whether, you know. So anyway, I guess we'll wrap it yeah, up. We'll wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. So, um, it's the end of the show. So I'm going to remind you again, go to Project Entertainment Network on Patreon and give them some money and get some free stuff. It's really cool. Yeah. Also go to zazzle.com slash 13 o'clock yeah. and buy some of our t-shirts eventually i'll add more i promise mm-hmm. and uh we'll tell we'll tell you what they look like when we get ours yeah and if you're on youtube uh please share your favorite shows with some of your friends we can get the subs up and uh we got a little bit of we got we got a show for everybody 
Yeah. And if you have any recommendations or shows you want us to do, because like I said, this one was a recommendation. Yeah. uh, Leave it in the comments and we'll do a show on it. Yeah. Leave it in the show and we'll do a comment, you know, if we want to. We might not. We're not promising anything. We'll see. (laughs) We'll see. We've had some good recommendations so far. Yeah. Yeah, We're going to get to Crowley. We're going to get to Crowley. Don't worry. Yeah. Because that's been recommended by a couple of people. So we're going to do that. We're going to do that. But um, so anyway, that will do it for this episode of 13 o'clock. Mm-hmm. And uh, please, oh, like us on Facebook and like us on Twitter. I forgot to mention mm-hmm. that. And that'll do it. We will see you next Tuesday. See you next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>